Another video from me. Have you ever heard the wind whisper or watched the night embrace the world? Isn't it fascinating how such descriptions can bring a scene to life? Oh, it is. It is. Today's lesson is how to use personification to elevate your writing. All right. Uh, and it's where we're going to explore basically how to give human characteristics to non-human things to an end. Yeah. Why is it? But, but Thomas, why is it important? Well, understanding and using personification helps with elevating descriptions to be more vivid and emotionally resonant. Got a drink when you say that word. What I'm basically saying is, uh, have you ever, uh, have you ever seen or read something where uh, the way did this, the author describes like an inanimate object, like the glasses, right? If they have like a human or a personification, it's not saying that it's a living thing, but it, it gives it a little bit more life. Uh, no pun intended. But uh, the thing is, what what is it exactly, though? What what is uh the personification. Well, personification is a literary device where non-human objects, animals, or ideas are given human attributes or emotions, helping to paint a more engaging and relatable picture for the reader. Or in uh, layman's term, it's just a clever way of uh, giving a more quote-unquote mundane element some life, some uh, thrilling uh, 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 extra, you know, you know, being a little extra. Anyway, we're going to do a real time uh, example today. We're going to write something and then just build on it and just we're going to actually we're going to go from like it not having personification and being very mundane to being like extremely crazy, uh, but only as, as an example of Hey, sometimes you got to pull it back a little bit, but look how far you can go with it kind of thing. As always, though, I'd like to give four tips before we jump into the exercise that get your brain thinking while we're working on things. Now, the first one is the power of personification, creating vivid imagery. Personification animates the settings and elements within it, transforming mere descriptions into experiences that uh, really help the reader uh, uh, see something as simple as a phone, the clouds, a storm, a chair, a cup of coffee differently. This technique helps to humanize the environment, making it more relatable and emotionally engaging in a sense. But ultimately, to implement this effectively, focus on integrating, uh, integrating sensory details that mimic human actions or emotions. For example... Describe how the storm clouds grumbled angrily across the sky. This personifies the clouds in a way that suggests an impending outburst, enhancing the atmospheric tension and preparing the reader for what's to come. So again, the storm clouds grumbled angrily across the sky. Instead of saying uh, the storm clouds uh, were off in the distance or, uh, you know, he grabbed his umbrella preparing for the coming storm in the distance, right? That is what I just did there is I'm describing what is happening. When you take the storm clouds grumbled angrily across the sky, uh, you know, he grabbed, he grabbed his umbrella. Uh, he grabbed his umbrella, umbrella preparing for the storm clouds gr that grumbled angrily across the sky. It's giving some sort of weight and value to uh, the storms, but it's also giving some life. It's creating a living entity without it actually being like that storm has eyes and thoughts and a brain. And, you know, so, um, but it does allow also for the reader to, it captures their imagination. It helps kind of fuel the way they're seeing the events unfold in their head. All right. All right, the human qualities of objects and nature. Now, by uh, attributing human emotions or actions to non-human entities, writers uh, can use this to invoke certain emotions and connections through empathy. Uh, you know, and this technique can or could potentially breathe life into the mundane, as we said earlier, making familiar scenes 
uh, have a little bit more impact. You know, you might want to choose emotions, though, or actions that align closely with the narrative or thematic elements of the story. You don't want to go off basis uh, from the themes or the mood. You know, stay tonally inside. For instance, trees stood... For instance, trees stood like silent guardians. Not only does this help give the tree a protective quality, but also enhances the sense of solitude or vi vigilance in the scene. Now, obviously, the tree isn't living. The, well, the tree is a living entity, but it is not a tree ent. It's not walking around. It's not purposefully guarding the area, but it gives the tree age. It gives the tree purpose. However, you know, you want to experiment with this, you know, the range of emotions, the joys, the angers. What is it actually doing? You know, it could maybe make it maybe the trees stood like uh, stood lurking like silent guardians. Right. So now that creates atmosphere. Uh, the trees. The trees crippled over uh, in silent agony once vigilant guardians of the forest of blah, blah, blah. OK, by the way, I've been to blah, blah, blah. Excellent apples. Anyway, those things create a little bit more mood. Yeah, some might call it a little purple, uh, purpley prose, uh, you know, but. If you don't do it all the time and you use it sparingly to add atmosphere or movement, uh, it's, it's very effective. OK, number three, personification in different genres, uh, each genre as usual, can harness the power of personification to serve different narrative functions. In children's literature, it might simply uh, uh, it might simplify complex ideas. Well, in gothic fiction, it can amplify the eerie or uncanny atmosphere. You want to tailor the use of these personifications uh, to the uh, expectations and conventions of the genre. For example, in fantasy, a river that whispers secrets can enrich the mystical elements of the world, while in horror, an old house that groans under its weight can enhance the suspense and fear factor. So again, uh, you know, they step through, they step through, uh, they step through the dead house uh, with each, which each uh, foot closer to the stairs, the house groaned under its own weight, right? Uh, a, uh, um, I don't know. A, a wordless warning to the group as they contemplated how deep to go, right? So now you're creating atmosphere. You're letting... Obviously, the house isn't alive unless it's the movie House or House 2. Very good. House 2. Excellent film. Um, anyway, number four. You want to avoid overuse, the pitfalls of personification, because sometimes it gets really exciting to just be like, let's do it. Let's give the pole some laugh. You know, the pole stood there. Uh, st the, the pole stared at me, waiting for me to strike it. With my, my inability to hold a sword uh, was was challenged as the uh, from the pole that stared at me or something. You know, something like that. I'm just making it off the top of my head. So, right? But then, like, so I looked at my sword <laughs> that's sharp teeth uh, nudged at me like, you know, like, all right, calm, calm down, buddy. <laughs> but overuse of personification can dilute its impact. Right. So you want to make uh, you don't want it to feel forced or uh, overly decorative because right? that's when you start falling into the purple prose and stuff like that. So it's essential to use this device, uh, you know, with intent, purpose. Don't overwhelm the readers and distract from their experience by like throwing it in every other line. Basically balance personification with straightforward descriptions and actions because not every object or element needs human characteristics. Sometimes sim simplicity can be more effective. Sometimes they're just running uh, across a bridge. Bridge don't need like, you don't need, you don't need the welcome the bridge welcomed them as they uh with the clitter clatter of you know uh, a song of their youth uh, as they ran across to the other side as they once did as children 
okay, yeah, all right, that's a fun sentence, but you don't need it, right? Unless it's narratively important. You know, sometimes they're just running across a bridge because maybe they would never there as kids. Anyway, uh, what I would do is regularly review your work and figure out, should I add it here? Should I take it away? Is it even needed? And then, you know, edit as necessary. All right, before we get into the example, please hit the bell icon, uh, subscribe, hit the bell icon, uh, like, comment, share, do whatever. If you're enjoying the lessons and want more insight on fine-toning your writing skills, remember, the videos are here. All right. How can personification transform a basic description? I don't know. Let's look at it. Let's see what we got. All right. Uh, we don't need this here. Beep. All right, let's do this. Okay, so uh, first first thing is first. Let's see. Here's a straightforward description of, uh, I don't know, something, right? We need something. Uh, we don't want it to be, what I'm saying is I don't want it to be too crazy. So let's say, uh, let's go with something very, uh, I don't know, everybody does cliche. The sun was setting over the the ocean. And the waves were moving towards the shore. The claw. All right. So if we look at this, uh, what can we do? What can we add? You know, um, I don't know. So the sun was setting over the ocean. Maybe, maybe we could say the sun, I don't know, uh, sank lazily into the ocean. Ah. And, uh, and the waves were uh, waves. The waves were I don't know eagerly. Uh, oh no 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 no. We gotta. We need another word to know. We need the movement because moving. We gotta. Well, how do we change move? Maybe crept. Oh yeah, crept. Uh, uh, we could even put eagerly back. Eagerly towards the shore. Oh yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Do you guys like when my face is up here? Do you, you like? Uh... Oh. All right. Um. All right. So the sun, the sun sank. So we added a little bit. We added a little bit. Uh, a little something, something. Right. So the sun sank. Uh, the sun sank lazily. Okay. We added the uh, into. Uh, we, we actually did that and uh, the waves were or the waves actually that doesn't even make sense the waves the waves crept out the... <laughs> okay there you go all right so can we do something else can we uh maybe uh i don't know let's see uh, let's get a little crazier all right we're gonna do a little crazier let's see Let's see what we got here. We got, uh, all right. Let's do, let's do, oh, here we go. Here we go. The sun, the sun cast a weary gaze over the horizon as it sank into the ocean while the waves, like excited, excited children, I'm trying to do the scare, the, the the horror voice from uh anyway, right towards the sandy ocean shores. Uh, if you ever seen uh, what's it with the? It's a story about Nosferatu, as if Nosferatu was real. You know, like they were filming the movie. You know, I'll eat her. I'll eat her later. You know, it's Willem Dafoe is playing the vampire. The actual, it's old, and it's um. Anyway, I'll eat her later. <laughs> anyway, all right, let's read over this. What is this thing? The sun cast a weary gaze over the horizon. Okay, so now we're getting a little, now we're getting a little crazy, right? We're adding a little bit, so, but we're also trying to make it a little pretty. So the, the sun cast a weary gaze over the horizon. I liked it, though. As it sank into the ocean. As it sank into the ocean. Well, the waves, 
like excited children. I like that. Raced towards the sandy shores. All right, so we're giving we're giving we're we're giving life to the sun, the waves, and the shores. Right? Can we get crazy though? Can we go crazy? I don't know. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, let's add some sensory details or something. I don't know. Uh... I don't know. All right. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take what we have. The sun cast. A weary gaze. Oh, let me let me bring this down. So. A weary. I'm sorry. So we're taking the. Can you see it? Yeah, you can see it. All right. The weary. The weary. <laughs> the weary sun. It's so weary, the sun. The, sun, the weary sun. Uh, oh, bid a golden. Because uh, we're playing we're playing with the sun, right? A golden farewell. Nah. Uh, to the day. Oh, draping the ocean in a cloak. Of flames. <laughs> I'm so, I haven't gotten much sleep last night. Uh, I just like to uh, have fun, though. You gotta have fun. What's the point of life if you're not having fun, right? Okay. So the flames. We gotta keep it going. The waves. The waves. Whispering. By the way, I write like this when I'm writing too. I like. I talk and I say the lines and I get a little wonky because you have to. Where were we? The waves, the waves whispering, the waves whispering. Oh, oh, secrets of the deep. Not the deep from uh, the boys, but the deep. Danced eagerly to the rhythms. I love rhythms. Who doesn't like putting the word rhythm in there? In there, right? Rhythms of a, hmm, let's make it a salty breeze so I could taste it. Each surge, a gentle caress. Caress, caress against the, the sandy. Let's go. We got the sandy from above, right? The sandy uh, cheeks of the shore. I want cheeks. Anyway. All right. So where are we? Oh, the weary sun. The weary. The sun is weary. Okay. But uh, the sun bid. Okay. Bid is a... Uh, is, is, is an action. It's doing something, right? But we'll add some uh, golden farewells. So it's not only is uh, we doing some sensory there, but also it's uh, I can't spell. Farewell to the day. So it's it's actively choosing to do something. I think I spelled draping wrong. Did I spell draping wrong? You can't see the thing. I have two monitors, by the way. I have the monitor that's being filmed then I have the monitor that's has the image, and then I have the monitor where I'm writing everything. All right, so uh, and I can look at any three of them. I don't know why I have three. All right, draping, draping is an action, right? So, uh, yeah, action in a cloak of flames uh, that becomes sensory. The waves whispering secrets of the deep. Okay, there's a personification. Uh, danced eagerly. Okay. Oh, this personification and a sense of movement, uh, the rhythms of a salty breeze, sensory, each surge, a gentle caress against the sand, and the cheeks of the shoe. So there we go. All right. Could we go crazier? Could we go crazier? Do you think we could? I don't know. I think four is enough. Is that four? That's four. All right. So um all right as you can see uh let's uh let's go over here now so i can see the screen better so i could see uh the thing because i have things written over here too i have everything everywhere you know the sun was setting over the the sun was setting over the ocean and the waves were moving towards the shore that's a look that's a fine that's a fine and dandy sentence don't get me wrong Fine and dandy. Uh, you could use that. The sun was the, right, except I probably wouldn't use was because I like to write in past tense, but just just as an example, the sun was setting 
right? Uh, and the waves were moving towards this is this is in uh, present tense. All right, just so, yeah. okay. Uh, which is fine. Um, most people like to write and pass. Well, not most. I should say some. There, there are people who choose. But today we're doing present, so just bear with me. All right. The sun uh, was setting over the ocean, and the waves were moving. Actually, this, <laughs> dude, this is this is past. And then, of course, you need to change it to uh, okay. Yeah, all right. I was writing in my normal. Right. Again, no edit. I didn't edit yet. I was just writing. Now that I'm foreseeing, my brain is now working. The sun uh, uh, was setting over the ocean, and the waves were moving towards the sura. It is a fair enough thing. But to give it some personification, we were like, sank lazily. So it cho it's choosing an action. It chose to sink or sank uh, lazily, okay? And th the way it sank is the personification, right? And then it crept, which is also technically a choice. It's personified as a choice because they are choosing, one chooses to do the style in which they crept, and they had an eagerness to that cripping. They were like, mm, let's go to the shore, right? But then we were like, let's let's get a little, let's go a little deeper. Let's, uh... Let's make it a little bit more detailed, right? That's what the third thing means. So the sun cast a weary gaze, weary gaze over the horizon, and it sank into the ocean where the waves, like exciting children, raced towards the sandy shores. And this is where you start getting into more like uh, pro writing. Now, obviously, this is a uh, this is not worked. It's just the you know just dump uh, dump and write <laughs> um but ultimately this is this is where you get like those really nice uh prose from like uh you know even old style writing and uh you know the, the 60s 70s 80s 90s 2000s right some of the writers nowadays you're like oh i really like that pair it's because they add a little something something to the movement it's not just the sun was setting over the ocean or the sun set over the ocean and the uh you know the waves uh, moved towards the shore you know it, it's giving movement and choice to these items it's a good personification right and then of course when we go here for the big the big change um it really it really adds a little something so now we gave the sun an emotional position. It was wary, right? Uh, it made a choice to bid. Uh, and then we added some sensory elements, a golden farewell to the day, uh, draping the ocean in a cloak of flames. So that's a visual sensory, right? The waves whispering secrets of the deep danced eagerly to the, the rhythms of a salty breeze. So there's a lot of sensory there, but it's also kind of, right? And in each surge, a gentle caress against the sandy cheeks of the shore. Now, there's a couple of things here, though. Like if I was teaching a class and uh, we weren't just dealing with personification and we were trying to enhance the narrative, uh, remember the rule uh, in narration when you're writing a passage or a pro, whatever, uh, every sentence must contain one or more of these three elements. Uh, plot. Uh, uh, character development or world building. So in this situation, this is just really pretty description. So uh, if I was to analyze this, uh, I'd be like, it's really pretty. Uh, you know, there's a lot of you. You got a lot of great sensory in there, but it's not doing it. Nothing is happening. So this would be an example of me saying uh, something is happening, but nothing is. You know, think or things are happening, but nothing is happening. All right. So. When this is just an example of how to add personification, how to add some sensory and how to add some descriptive elements to those uh, tools. But again, you know, uh, you have to add, you know, Christine uh, sat on the uh, sat uh, on the beach, embraced by the sand. Uh, under her outstretched uh, legs, right? So, um, 
Do, 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 do. This is Persona of Fusion, right? So it's true name, okay? Now it's in the perspective of the POV of Christine. So now this is character. She is seeing this all unfold. So this all becomes character development. So Christine sat on the beach, embraced by the sand under her outstretched legs. The, wear, the weary sun bid a golden farewell to the day, draping. The so all this, just because I added that POV, that changes this power, this whole passage into how she is perceiving it. And now it's not description for description's sake. Something is happening. He's seeing everything like this. She's witnessing. She's personifying the sun to be wary. She's personifying it bidding a farewell, a golden farewell to the day. She's watching the sun drape over the ocean like a cloak of flames. She's acknowledging these things. It's not just a description anymore. It's how she's absorbing the scene. She, the waves themselves are whispering secrets of the deep and dance eagerly to the rhythms of salty breeze. Each surge a gentle caress against the sandy cheeks of the shore. Uh, you know, the shore, uh, shore, inching closer to her bare feet. <laughs> bare feet without a care in the world so now now i get to utilize all the quote unquote descriptiveness like all this is ultimately doing nothing something is happening like the sun is going we we just basically said the sun is setting and uh and what you call it the um uh, the waves are moving towards the shore. That's that's ultimately what we said, but we just made it really pretty, right? But now that we added her POV and we ended it with her POV, basically, uh, even though it's inching closer to her bare feet without a care in a world, we're actually personifying the feet as well in that moment because the feet have no care in the world, meaning she's not even struggling or or running away from the, 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 the chance of uh, the ocean touching her so i say this to my students all the time i go look write your beautiful pretty colorful paragraphs all you want just make sure that they're uh doing one of those three elements where it's plot world building uh plot character development or world building and remember the moment you put it into their pov everything you're writing in that passage is a representation of the pov character meaning i probably wouldn't write like this in someone else's POV in this narrative because we're establishing character by how she perceives the world by utilizing that description, those personifications, you know, it, it adds to her character. We're saying to maybe she, it's like the people that look at clouds and the clouds are, uh, you know, a taco or a pizza, pizza, mm, pizza, right? So this is an example of her mind seeing the world this way. So maybe if I had her there, you know, and then, you know, maybe Derek is next to her and Derek, Derek laid on laid flat out on his back, uh, staring up at the clouds un, unmoved, uh, by the serene, uh, uh, scenario, you know, the serene uh, environment or the serene, you know, sunset or whatever, you know. So now, now he's not personifying anything. All right. So because that moment is in his POV, of course, if she looked, Oh, if she, if, if the next paragraph was, you know, inching closer to her bare feet without a care in the world, you know, uh, Derek, Derek snored away, uh, laying flat on his back, <clears throat> unaware of the serene moment. That's, uh, uh, that's still in her. We're still telling the story through her close P. It's third person, but uh, limited. It's still her POV because he, you know, she's acknowledging that he's no care in the world. He's just laying there. He's snoring. He's not a part of it, right? You could even end that paragraph where, like, she she drowned she drowned out his loud snores. 
uh, staying within the moment of uh, her piece or whatever. And, you know, okay, whatever. But anyway, I just added a little extra something to the lesson at the end where I'm just saying, you know, when you're writing these uh, personifications or, or adding sensory details or even uh, creating a pretty purpley prose, just remember to add something that moves the plot along, character development, and world building. Because the way the world looks isn't world building, okay? It's how the world functions that's world building. Uh, but more importantly, I could have added uh, uh, a plot, character, and world in one sentence. I could have just did two of those elements. It just needs one or more of those elements in each sentence. Sometimes... Uh, a sentence like we just did the uh this sentence this sentence automatically makes all the other sentences now character development so you can activate something too um you i could have also i could have also done this where instead of starting it off like that you know i could uh, uh, inching closer to her Christine's bare feet without a care in the world. She sat, she sat there, she sat there, she sat on the beach and braced by the sand under her outs. I, I could do that too. Um, the reason I probably would put her in the, I would do, I would probably use this version is because you want to set the POV. Uh, uh, right off the bat, just so the characters, it's just so the readers know they're they're reading through that. Anyway, all right, I'm going on and on. Boop, 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 boop. I, I love I love uh, studying writing stuff. That that stuff's fun to me. Anyway, uh, what's next? Oh, question, question. What's an object or element of nature you encounter daily? How would you personify it? Share your creative descriptions in the comments below. And if you can, put it in your POV or a POV. Uh, if you haven't done so already and you find these this video helpful or other videos, but you just haven't done so already, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Uh, while hitting the bell icon for more content. If all that is too much for you, just, just subscribe. If you're already subscribed, just like. You don't, you don't have to do it all. Just, just one of them. I don't, you know, I'm not going to make you work. You're here to learn. You're not, you're not here to work. Anyway, final thoughts. Personification does much more than simply decorate the narrative. It serves as a profound bridge between the human experience and the broader world. By imbuing non-human elements with human qualities, we make the abstract tangible and the inanimate vibrant. This not only enhances the reader's connection to the story's environment, but also deepens the emotional, uh, uh, truth and value and elements of the narrative itself through personification mundane elements of the world are transformed into active participants in the storytelling process this shift from the static to the dynamic makes your writing more lively and engaging in other words it allows it to have movement um it invites readers to see the world through the lens that highlights the emotional and experimental links between them and the narrative universe you've created, hopefully through the POV of your characters. By assigning human emotions and actions to nature and objects, uh, personification fosters a stronger empathetic connection between your audience and the text itself because we now can relate emotionally to the thing that is being personified. For example, uh, the we know what we're, being wary means, so we can relate that emotionally to the sun um the uh dances eagerly or you know the surge of gentle caress against the sandy cheeks like all that would make sense to us and we could relate that to the object or objects at hand. okay uh readers are more likely to care about what happens in a story if they feel the world within it shares in the human-like capacity for emotion and experience because this empathy makes the state the stakes of your narrative feel more real and pressing but remember please don't overdo it so when utilizing personification effectively 
Uh, it can turn ordinary descriptions into magical realism or, uh, you know, where a tree can have a conversation with you. It can be that direct. It can be literally a tree is like, hey, how's it going, buddy? But it also, uh, you know, it also could be something that's more metaphysical and it's just something to add a little light or a little movement to the descriptions where wind itself can whisper secrets and cities can sleep right the, you ever read that and you're like oh the city slept uh slept under the god of the, the you know the men and women who protected her streets uh their metal their their metal boots uh, you know uh, echoed through the uh the, the alleyways of the of the slumbering city, whatever, you know, like that's personification. Anyway, uh, this not only fuels the imagination of your reader because they're relating to these words and terms and putting it onto these inanimate objects, but also opens up new avenues for creativity in your writing, allowing you to explore themes and ideas in, in visual and emotionally rich ways. But you have to remember that personification is a tool that should be used deliberately and thoughtfully. When overused, it can overwhelm your narrative and distract from the story's core messages. Also, you could turn into just being descriptive, just like what I showed, where it's not really doing anything. Something is happening, but nothing is really happening. So you have to add and use it in a way that tells the, the narrative that helps with plot, character, and world building, right? So uh, if you use it sparingly, is basically what I'm saying, with intent, personification can beautifully enhance your writing, turning simple prose into poetry and scenes into portraits of life. As with any literary technique, the key to mastering personification is practice and feedback. So you want to experiment with different levels of personification in your writing projects. You also want to seek out feedback from readers and fellow writers to see how your use of personification affects your story's impact. I have this line in my book where it says, uh, you know, they dropped the coin. I'm going to I'm going to paraphrase. Uh, uh, they drop the coins onto a wooden table and the coin, the metallic, uh, the coins um, uh, moved across the, the table like a, a collection of metallic uh, beetles. Right. Trying to escape uh, whatever. Again, I'm paraphrasing because I don't have it in front of me. But I turn the coins into met metallic metallic insects uh, scurrying across the the, the wooden the wooden uh, the wooden table wooden whatever. But that is that's a personification. The coins aren't really moving on their own, but they they give the impression of uh, moving like uh, metallic insects. Anyway. Uh, oh, oh you know, the reason I brought that up is because uh, when I had people read, they were oh, I, I, that's a really great. They, they were like, I love the imagery of that. You know, they obviously knew the coins weren't physically insects or, or magically imbued to move like that. But either way, I encourage you to uh, basically look at your surroundings, listen to the people in your life and just uh, imagine what could be going through that movement of the inanimate object um and maybe ask yourself how would a day in your life look if narrated by objects around you how would you, you know if you drop something pick something up you turn the water on for a shower whatever the case may be try to uh, play with the exercise because remember you don't uh you should uh you should practice not only when you write but when you're trying to improve a skill itself all right, next in the video is actually uh, a request. Uh, they want to, what is a foil in a narrative? Uh, spoiler alert, it's not what you wrap around your potato to cook it. Please don't uh, unsubscribe. <laughs> They're just jokes. Terrible, terrible jokes. Anyway. As always, peace and harmony, truth in action, and keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Love you.